Good morning. I am Joshua, and uh, I will be preaching the sermon today, probably uh, for the last time. As it's, it's no secret, uh, my family and I are leaving the local body of Crossroads Church here in the near future. I know I speak for Trina and our kids when I say we love this church. And we hope to see you again. I've had many goodbye conversations the last couple weeks with some of you, and prayerfully, we'll have many more in the coming weeks. When the topic of seeing each other again inevitably comes up, some of you have taken the liberty of inviting yourself down to my yet-to-be-built house. (laughs) And that's totally fine. (laughs) Hopefully that will happen. And I mean that. But will we really see each other again? Maybe. Maybe not. But I know for many, as I, as I reminisce on all the goodbyes I've said throughout my life, it probably won't happen. And that's okay. I'm all right with that. I am grateful that because of our gracious elders, I've been given the opportunity to share with you all, Crossroads Church, a goodbye letter of sorts in the form of one last sermon before my departure. If I could leave one thing here, it would be a message of hope. My hope. That for those in Christ, there is a great hope that we will one day see each other again. That we will be gathered up in the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God, to worship Him, to be in His presence together for all of eternity. But even more important, I want to leave a message that I have made my personal mission to be understood, and that is this. On the last day, we will all stand before God in judgment. This is real. And those that are found on that last day to be outside of Christ have no hope. There will be no hope to see each other again. The scripture text today is very clear on this. I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide my lips to be very clear on this. If you are found to be outside of Christ found without the righteousness of the Son, which is the only sufficient payment for your sin against a thrice holy God, you will be cast into hell for all of eternity. If this scares you, good. When I got the call a few weeks ago from Pastor Grant, letting me know the elders wanted to offer this opportunity, to preach one last time, I did what any good preacher should do. I first prayed and then discussed my sermon ideas with my wife. And you must do that, men. Within an hour of speaking with Grant, I had my text. So I pitched this sermon idea to Trina, and she was supportive, supportive as always but did offer one critique. It seems that your sermons tend to be fire and brimstone. I really don't mean for them to be. But the truth is, so many others today never speak of these things. The one who created you and created me, he breathed life into us, spoke everything needed to sustain us in existence. But he also gave us commandments to follow. He gave us a guide on how 
we are to live. And we have not only broken them, we've created every excuse to justify what we do. And to make matters worse, we mock him. We mock him. We mock him by living in a way that tells him, we don't believe you. We don't believe you are coming back. We don't believe you will sit on your throne and we will stand before you in judgment. We don't believe you would really do any of the negative stuff that your word says you will do. So we don't mention it. We don't talk about it. We don't confront each other with it. We just focus on his love, his grace, his mercy. Folks, don't misunderstand me. I love that my wife would point out that I only seem to preach about fire and brimstone because she wants to remind me of his grace and his love because she knows I belong to him. (laughs) These things are very much real. I am saved by his grace. But justice and wrath are just as much his attributes as his love and mercy. And to truly know him, we must try and understand all of his attributes. Do you know all about your wife? Your husband? You want to, don't you? And full transparency... If I was absolutely certain I was only preaching to those that already belong to him, that's what I would say. Have hope, you children of God, for soon he is coming back for us. I pray this to be true for everyone in this room. But we are still in the world where the world preaches God is love and in Him there is no judgment for our sin because He just wants us to have our best life now. Folks, if you are having your best life now, you are doomed in eternity. Let us remember this. God is love. The definition of it. Pastor Grant just preached on this last week in Mark chapter 1. But before Christ spoke about his love or his grace or before he went to the cross to drink every last drop of God's wrath for the sins of his people, he preached the first word of his earthly mission. Repent. If you would open your Bibles to Matthew 13 with me. We will be focusing on verses 17 through 15. Or, sorry. 47 through 50. If you have a pew Bible, you'll find this on page 972. And if you don't own a copy of God's Word, I would invite you as a gift from the body here at Crossroad Church to take that Bible home with you. Open it. Read what He has what is given to us without distraction of your smartphone or computer. Please stand in the honor of reading God's holy word with me. Matthew 13, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it is filled, they drew it up on the beach. And they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are the words of the Lord. Let's pray to help in understanding these things. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you and ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance in discernment and understanding of your word that you have written and preserved for us. 
in these few moments, please guide me by speech and guide these people by hearing that we would all clearly understand what you have given to us. And we pray all these things in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. So in the times that I've had to preach up here, um, I've never had the luxury, if you would call it that, and Pastor Grant would probably argue, it's not quite the luxury you think. The luxury of preaching a sermon series or even preaching in succession with other brothers where I wasn't forced to build the context of the passage. I'm sure most of us will be familiar with the surrounding passages or maybe even this one in particular. But what we have done is landed in the midst of Christ teaching the disciples on the idea of the kingdom of heaven. This passage and the ones leading up to it find Jesus surrounded by the disciples and at times crowds. And he is teaching these kingdom parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, as we see here. Some of these parables were said in front of large crowds, which, has, which was to fulfill the prophecy written in Psalm 78 and repeated here in verse 35. I will open my mouth in parable. But what we see in verse 11 of this chapter, I think, is very important to understand. That he wasn't teaching the crowds. As it had not been given to the, it had not been granted to the crowds to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He was teaching the disciples. Do you see this? Christ speaking to the great crowds was to fulfill prophecy. The mysteries were revealed only to the disciples who very soon would be the ones tasked with teaching the mysteries themselves in order to advance the kingdom of heaven or God's kingdom here on earth through the local church. Which brings up a point before we go on. As we read through the New Testament, as we read through Matthew and the other Gospels, Does anyone else notice these most interchangeable phrases? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Why the two different yet similar phrases? Do they mean the same thing? Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven 32 times. And according to John MacArthur's commentary on Matthew, is the only gospel writer that uses this phrase. Luke uses the phrase kingdom of God almost as many times in his gospel. They're talking about the same thing, but this is very interesting, and if you're a note taker, I would write this down. Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience, and being a Jew himself knows that he did not speak the name of God and would often substitute heaven when referring to God himself. An example of this, if we were to need one, would be, heaven is smiling on me today. Now getting to our text, we see Christ with the disciples on the beach. Now you see why I picked this text, right? (laughs) We can almost picture the disciples on the beach casting this net And Christ just slips his teaching into conversation with, hey, you guys are fishermen. You'll like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that dragnet. And they would draw it up on shore. It was a big net. If you've never seen one, they come in many various sizes. They're weighted around the net. And these guys would have to stand there on the beach or in the boat and heave this net out into the water covering a large area and as they would drag it back it would gather fish of every kind all kinds of junk everything as they drug this up onto the beach 
These guys were career fishermen. They knew which fish would bring in the money and which ones wouldn't. Which fish were edible and which ones weren't. So this is what they were actively doing as Jesus was teaching them. They were sorting the fish. And verse 48 states that they gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. Do you see this? It's important to what's coming up that we see this. The bad they threw away. They didn't throw them back. I'm sure most of us here have been fishing before. When you catch a fish, you take your picture or you decide if you're going to keep it and take it home and cook it, and if you're not, you put it back in. You throw it back. Unless it's a carp, then we throw those away. Well, these guys are in there living with the fish they catch. I'm sure they have a, they have to be quality fish. If they're bad, they don't want them to go back to the population to make more bad fish. They they don't want to throw them back and continue all day long catching the same fish over and over and over again. They're out there for a purpose. So they threw them away. Gone. Christ is using this moment to teach the disciples that this is what will happen at the end of the age, the final day. The kingdom of heaven will have gathered up all kinds of like a dragnet. A dragnet does not discriminate. Verse 47 states this, fish of every kind. The kingdom of heaven is gathering up people of all kinds as we speak. You think this isn't true? It's Sunday. Thousands and thousands of people all around the world woke up this morning, got ready, Some of them put on their best, drove to a church building to participate. Some that are seeking holiness and communion with God, but some that are seeking a way for their life to be better or a group to be a part of or gain some motivation for the week ahead, but only if it fits with their idea of Christianity. American evangelicalism especially has made this concept of Christianity just another check block on the list of the American success model. Spouse, check. Kids, check. House with a white picket fence, check. Dog, check. I didn't include cat. Christian, And what this ends up looking like is a virtue signaling concession of the truth to appease the masses that are more concerned with unity than truth. We are not accountable to have all the boxes checked. We are accountable to God. Folks, false teachers exist because we give them an audience. Carnal, worldly people sit in pews on Sundays because we don't disciple them or even get to know them. Matthew 7 points this out very clearly. Many will say to me on that day, that final day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Picture it your neighbor, your family member, you. With a hope-filled house, the front row faithful, gutted, removed from the dragnet, crying out as the angels are casting the wicked into the furnace of fire, the holy, just judge will give a verdict. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Church, 
Are we examining ourselves to know if we're in the faith? Are we exhorting each other to follow after Christ? I knew this older gentleman quite a few years ago. He's with the Lord now. He was much older than myself at the time. When we were introduced and as we shook hands, the very first thing he said to me was, do you know where you're going when you die? The first thing. He wasn't concerned with what I did for a living. He wasn't concerned with my goals in life. He was concerned with my eternal soul. This is the boldness of a Christian that is, cons- that is certain of his salvation and loves his neighbor so much that he didn't care what people thought about him. His own family described him as weird and crazy on multiple occasions. But he only cared that people would have a chance to experience Christ as he had and as he still is. So in this parable, we see Christ using this dragnet to teach the disciples how they are to gather up. He said when he started his mission and he called them forward, he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. What does that mean? Well, what does the dragnet represent? Let's think about this a minute. The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. We know what the kingdom of heaven is, right? Here on earth, it is represented by the church. And how are we as a church supposed to advance God's kingdom on earth? Again, in Matthew, I think it's very clear. If we were to go to Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So, what are we to do? Go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Preaching. Teaching. Romans 10, 14 says... How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Preaching is the dragnet that will gather all kinds. Preaching is what draws or should draw people into the church building. Preaching is the umbrella under which everything else in church should fall. Sound doctrine from the pulpit leads to sound doctrine throughout all other ministries of the church. Christians grow in Christ under sound teaching, all led by the Holy Spirit. Christ is telling the disciples how to build the kingdom of heaven through casting the dragnet of preaching, which will be will bring in men of all kinds. But the sorting is not their job. Any guesses on why the angels would do the sorting? Most maybe know this, but my day job is as an independent insurance adjuster. Independent means I don't work for an insurance company. Insurance companies hire us to go out and perform the inspection, to write up our recommendations on the claim based on the policy and law. But being independent means we can operate on facts only. We aren't even allowed to give our opinion on claims. And we are to be fair to both parties, even though it is understood that the insurance company is the one that hired us, and we are working for them. If the facts point in favor of the insured, We are to present those facts as such. Legally, this is called acting in good faith. 
We collect all facts, investigate all facts, and make fact-based recommendations that are either considered or not based on the facts of the contractual policy and the law. Kind of like Joe Friday, just the facts, ma'am. In that show, Dragnet. See what I did there? They don't teach that in seminary. Anyway, okay, anyway, that is what the angel's role is. The angels do not get the offer of salvation. They do not get God's unmerited favor handed to them. That is not what they were created for. They were created to serve God fully, and this is one way they do it. God has laid out the facts. Humanity is guilty of sin. We have forsaken God. All of humanity is at enmity with God. We are enemies. We are wicked, and the wicked shall be cast into hell for all eternity. Period. And based only on the facts of the case, the angels will come forth and carry out the verdict of the perfect judge as he's handed it down. Matthew Henry, a well-known Puritan minister, puts it this way in his commentary on this passage. And we need not ask how they will distinguish them when they have, be- have both their commission and their instructions from him that knows all men. And particularly knows them that are his and them that are not. And we may be sure there shall be no mistake or blunder either way. God is a perfect God. The wicked will be sorted out of the dragnet and thrown into the furnace of fire. Not back to earth just to continue living their life. No way. Remember what I said about the bad fish? I told you it would come back around. Just like the bad fish were thrown away, the wicked will be cast in the furnace of fire. Hell. Eternal punishment. There's no going back into the sea just to swim back home or meet back up with your buddies. Yo, you wouldn't believe what just happened to me. It may surprise you if I told you how many times in my life I've heard, well, all my friends are probably going to be there, so I'll just go down there and party with them. It won't be a party. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound like a party to me. In fact, this statement, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, indicates that this fire does not lead to annihilation like it so devastatingly does here on earth. But eternal torment. Charles Spurgeon says it this way, Those who would have us think lightly of the punishment of the ungodly have no countenance in the teachings of Lord Jesus. This is a problem. We don't understand what wicked means. We don't believe we or anyone we care about could be wicked and destined for punishment. But what about the righteous? It says the wicked will be taken out from among the righteous. That's good, right? Someone is righteous. So who is this in the net? Who are these righteous people? Anyone? According to Romans 3.10, there is none righteous. Not even one. Nobody. According to Paul's letter to the Romans, which is God's holy word that the angels must use as fact when sorting out the dragnet, not even one. Based on that, they may as well drag the whole net into the furnace. But wait. God's word says there are righteous present. 
The wicked are sorted out from among the righteous. That's what it says. God's word is inerrant, meaning without error. It cannot contradict itself, but we clearly see two passages here that look like two meanings. No one is righteous, no, not one. The wicked taken out from among the righteous. But how? But God, right? God, who did nothing more than speak and breathe all we know and pretend to understand into existence. He created a garden and a man and plopped him right down in the middle of it. God created him a wife and gave him commands, and he failed. He failed to wash her with the water of the word and lead her, and she was tempted by Satan. These creatures, these created beings, sinned against the holy God who created them, disobeyed his command, and doomed all of humanity. That every human born from that moment on would face death, but even more so, they would be born spiritually dead. Ephesians 2 puts it this way, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love for us, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, dead in our transgressions, he made us alive with Christ. We are all, every one of us, born sinners. Dead in our sin. It is our nature to choose our own desires over anything and everyone, even God. As stated earlier, we are enemies with God. Wicked by nature, but even as God slaughtered one of his own created animals to clothe the original sinners, Adam and Eve, in the garden, he told them the plan. That the, women, that the woman's offspring would crush the head of the serpent who tempted them to sin. That offspring who came to this earth fully God and fully man, born a virgin because due to the fall... Anyone born of normal conception is a sinner. And though tempted in every way that we have, and more so, never fell into temptation and lived a sinless life that we could not live. In perfect devotion to the Father. See that? And when they hung Christ on that cross, as they spit on him and beat him, as he faced humiliation that we couldn't in our wildest imaginations think about going through, most of the time we're too afraid to ask where somebody's even going when they die. That humiliation was nothing compared to a holy God pouring out his full wrath on his son for the sin that we've committed. but it was the only way. A holy God cannot commune with sin, cannot fellowship with sin, or he would no longer be holy. Sin must be paid for. That is what Christ did for for those the Father has given him. And it pleased the Father to crush him for it. He became like the container the good fish were gathered into. The angels will take the wicked and cast them into the furnace of fire, and the righteous they will find have been sealed in the container of Christ's righteousness. Hope. There's hope. But only for those in Christ, because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Do you know him? Better yet, does he know you? Has he done such a work in your life that you love what you once hated and you now hate what you once loved? 
This has to be true. If you're truly in Christ. Ezekiel 37 states this very plainly. As Ezekiel is looking out over the valley full of dry, dead bones. Telling God, only you know if these bones can live. Only you know. And God tells him to speak to the pile of bones. Preach to the pile of bones. Tell them, thus saith the Lord. Preach my words to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. There's no denying those bones were changed at that moment, never to be the same. We must be changed by Christ to belong to Him. We cannot continue to lay there dead in our sin. In verses 47 through 50, Christ had taken the time to teach the disciples that there is a distinction, a distinct difference between the wicked who will be cast into hell for all of eternity and righteous who belong to him and will be with him for all eternity. And when he concluded, he asked them one last thing. Matthew 13, verse 51. Have you understood all these things and they said to him yes my prayer is that you can confidently answer yes today and that we will see each other again let's pray heavenly father we we have sinned against you. We have sinned against you in our thought, our actions. We have sinned against you in so many ways that we don't even recognize today, but we pray that you have made a change in our lives that every day that we walk this earth, we will see more and more how sinful we are by nature. And as you are refining us by dragging those out of us in our repentance because of our understanding of what it is and what we've done. Lord, that you would be made bigger and more full in our lives. That our hearts would be made new to live for you, that our hearts would be made new to have so much love for our neighbor as the world wants to project back on us that we're not truly loving our neighbor, but how can we not when we are pointing their sin out and pointing them to you? How much more could we ever love anyone than to show them the way to et eternal life? Lord, I pray for Crossroad Church and the elders that are shepherding over it. Lord, the church will continue. You've built it. You are leading it. As our family prepares to leave, this church will continue without us. And I'm so thankful for that. Lord, may we lift up your name first and foremost in our lives. And we pray all these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.